this job of yours. Uh, it's murder on relationships. In every Bond movie, there's the gadget, the quippy villain with a Baroque master plan, and of course, the Bond girl. Over the decades, 007 has had tons of girlfriends, a few combative sexual relationships, and two tragic losses of a woman he actually loved. Let's dig into the history of Bond girls, the different ways they fit into the formula, and how modern Bond movies have tried to square Bond's heart with his job as a stone-cold killer. It would be a pretty cold bastard who didn't want revenge for the death of someone he loved. The most famous articulation of the Bond formula comes surprisingly enough from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory author Ruel Dahl. In an interview with Playboy, Dahl recounted the guidelines he received from Bond producers Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman before writing You Only Live Twice. There were two fixed points in a Bond movie, Bond himself and the quote, girl formula. That formula breaks Bond girls down into a few main types, the sacrificial lamb, the femme fatale, and the heroine. Which girl do you select? Let's start with the sacrificial lamb, perhaps the most frustrating type of Bond girl. These are women who fall for Bond, then die as a way of motivating him to complete his mission. As Dahl puts it, quote, girl number one is pro-Bond. She stays around roughly through the first reel of the picture. Then she is bumped off by the enemy, preferably in Bond's arms. Next, there's the femme fatale, an archetype easily recognizable from other spy stories. James Bond, who only has to make love to a woman, she repents it and immediately returns to the side of right and virtue. But not this one. These women work with the movie's villain, often as the mastermind's primary minion. Worse still, they often commit the ultimate sin against Bond. They betray him after sleeping with him. As Dahl put it, quote, girl number two is anti-Bond. She must capture Bond and Bond must save himself by bowling her over with sheer sexual magnetism. Finally, there's the heroine. These are your classic Bond girls, women who ally with Bond and help him over the course of the movie. These women are Bond's equal, or at least something close to it. Ooh, yeah, nice moves. Just like Bond. As Dahl put it, quote, girl number three is violently pro-Bond. She occupies the final third of the picture and she must on no account be killed, nor must she permit Bond to take any lecherous liberties with her until the very end of the story. The heroine's withholding of sex until the end of the movie turns her into a kind of prize, delivering what feels like a happily ever after, even though we know that happiness will only last until the next movie when this Bond girl will be replaced by an exciting new one. Where does the Bond girl formula actually come from? Partly, it has its origins in Ian Fleming's original Bond novels and his own life. Fleming dated Muriel Wright, whom he called Mew or Honeytop, on account of her striking blonde hair and became the ultimate blueprint for his Bond girls. Wright was the direct inspiration for the most iconic Bond girl of all, Honey Rider, played by Ursula Andress in Dr. No. Honey Rider's entrance contains all of the DNA of the Bond girl. She's there for Bond to appreciate, a prompt for lurid banter, and above all, an attractive woman for the audience. Looking for shells? No, I'm just looking. And of course, Honey is established as Bond's reward at the end of the movie. This template held for almost all of the original Bond novels and films like Goldfinger, Thunderball, and of course, Dolls You Only Live Twice. These early films also established Bond's casual misogyny as a core part of his charm. You should be locked up in a cage. And contain scenes where Bond's idealized masculinity apparently has no need for the Bond girl's consent. The biggest exception to the early Bond girl formula came in 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the only film to star George Lazenby when Bond gets married and prepares to give up his life as a spy only to lose his wife on their wedding day. She's having a rest. Bond feels real loss in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but after that, the movies veer away from the possibility he might get attached to anyone. Instead, Bond sleeping with the women he meets becomes more a matter of course. The reboot movies increase their focus on a surprising Bond woman, one with genuinely more power than Bond himself, his boss, M. Judi Dench had already played Bond's superior M in the Brosnan movies, but the relationship hadn't been fully explored before Daniel Craig put on the tux. Rather than focusing on an erotic relationship, M's identity as a Bond woman relies on a different set of feminine tropes, which illuminate Bond's essence as a grown-up, disobedient child. A woman? Yes. But it's not what you think. Your mother? 
She likes to think so. Eventually, like the sacrificial lamb from Doll's formula, M dies in Bond's arms, reaffirming their relationship. I should get one thing right. And as we've seen in this franchise, the best way for a Bond woman to be empowered is for her to die. Of course, the other not-a-Bond girl, who's one of the most major feminine presences in Bond's life, is Moneypenny, whose core identity established in the early films is that she's pining for Bond, but tragically for her, can't have him because she's chosen to be a professional. You never take me to dinner, period. I would, you know. Only Anne would have me court-martialed for uh, illegal use of government property. Today's Eve Moneypenny subtly updates the dynamic to be more in line with today's norms of workplace attraction, and to give Moneypenny more of a life outside Bond. In the words of actor Naomi Harris, I think she still has her soft spot for Bond, that's never going to go, but she's an independent woman with her own life. It was hardly my best shot. Not sure I can survive your best. Doubt you'll get the chance. In 2006's Casino Royale finds Bond, now played by Craig, at the very beginning of his career, before he's even 007. Casino Royale is an origin story, putting in place many of the pieces of the James Bond mythos, showing how Bond became a cold, womanizing murderer. And the real heart of Casino Royale and of all the Craig Bond movies is Vesper Lind. I'm the money. Every penny of it. Introduced halfway through the movie as the suit in charge of Bond's funding, Vesper gives as good as she gets, reading Bond's entire personality within moments of meeting him. By the cut of your suit, you went to Oxford or wherever. I actually think human beings dress like that. Later on, Vesper saves Bond's life, totally and unequivocally. Eventually, Vesper's ability to see and understand Bond causes him to completely fall in love with her. Whatever I am, I'm yours. For the second time in Bond movie history, he quits his job for love, the first time being for his marriage to Tracy. Then it all comes crashing down, literally, when Bond discovers that Vesper is working with the terrorists, and she dies. However, Vesper's death motivates Bond to find her terrorist handler, Mr. White. It's the first time the classic Bond theme music appears in the film, and the first time Bond has appeared as the character we came to know over the course of decades, and it all happens because of this fundamental loss. Later on, M confronts Bond with his tendency to manipulate women, which has become even colder since Vesper. Look how well your charm works, James. They'll do anything for you, won't they? And when Bond meets other women, like the widow Lucia Scara in Spectre, he is unable to connect with them at all. How can you talk like this? Can't you see him grieving? Mm. So why is Vesper so important? She isn't just any Bond girl, she's all three archetypes in one. A heroine who matches Bond, betrays him, and eventually dies to motivate him to embark on his entire career. And this origin story sets her up as the reason why Bond is only able to relate to women in a few different ways. Vesper, she gave everything for you. Forgive her. No Time to Die, the first Bond film in the post-Me Too and Time's Up era, features Leah Seydoux, Anna de Armas, and Lashana Lynch in roles that consciously at least attempt to depart from the Bond girl's past. Lynch's Nomi has inherited the 007 title from Bond himself, making her quite literally the equal that the Bond heroine type is supposed to be, while consciously not sexualizing her. Perhaps most significantly of all, the movie also includes among its writers Phoebe Waller-Bridge, only the second female writer to be credited in the entire franchise's history, and indicating a growing intention to incorporate an actual female perspective into this character. The question remains, is it possible to truly move beyond the Bond girl's old-school rules without totally losing the essence of her or of the Bond story structure itself? So long as we keep getting Bond movies, the important question isn't whether Bond girls are empowered, it's whether they're given the same level of depth as Bond himself, rather than simply giving him someone to bounce off of. Our relationships don't seem to last. I know the feeling. The challenge is whether the Bond girl of tomorrow has staying power, the ability to interest us in more than just her relationship to Bond, and the chance to develop her own story. You think of women as disposable pleasures rather than meaningful pursuits. 